In this discussion, we will be focusing on glycogen, which is a polysaccharide that exists in our bodies. And I first need to discuss how it looks like so that it would be easier for us to understand how it is made and how it is broken down. So first, we have to know that glycogen, so maybe I could write the word there, glycogen is a polysaccharide made up of nothing else but glucose. So it's essentially just many thousand molecules of glucose attached to one another. Now that would uh, allow us to review a little bit about how we draw our carbohydrates. So as you can see here, this is uh, the Hayworth projection of a single molecule of glucose. And the way we count it is from here, uh, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, right? And this is not supposed to be new to us at this point. Now, we do note that in glycogen, we normally have three atoms or three locants which are bonded to something else. For, the, for this case, we have carbon one, and then here we have carbon four, and then we have here carbon six. Now also as a little review of our glycosidic bonds, remember that your glycosidic bonds are named after the carbons that are connected. For example, how do I call this glycosidic bond right here? Well, since it's a bond between carbon four and carbon one, then we could say that this bond right here is an alpha one four glycosidic bond. Alpha, because the anomeric carbon one is ha having its bond pointing uh, downward. Actually, there's a more accurate way of saying that, but usually we do consider D glucose as the component of glycogen. So we just uh, make it shortcutted. Uh, as long as it's pointing downward, it's alpha. So that means that this is what you can see here is yet again another alpha 1 4 because this is 4, this is 1, and the bond is pointing down. That explains why carbons 1 and 4 are always bonded in glycogen. But Every once in a while, we actually see carbon number six of some, not all, but some glucose molecules being bonded to another molecule of glucose. In this case, the glycosidic bond that we are seeing here is a one six bond. And since the carbon number one is still pointing downward, it's not as obvious here, but it's pointing downward, we call this as an alpha one six glycosidic bond. Now, if we try to zoom this molecule out, uh, maybe we could use white. Uh, it's like this is a molecule of glucose. This is an alpha 1, 4. Another glucose, 1, 4. Glucose, 1, 4. Another 1, 4. 1, 4. 1, 4. 1, 4. So what do you observe? You would actually see here that just like this one, alpha 1, 4, 1, 4, 1, 4. If I continuously uh, connect my glucoses by alpha 1, 4 bonds, my molecule is just increasing in length. So we could say that the alpha 1, 4 glycosidic bond is responsible for the linearity of the glucose uh, units in glycogen. However, the moment that I have an alpha 1, 6 glycosidic bond, you can see that it's actually going away from the line. So it's as if an alpha 1, 6 would allow us to have glucose molecules outside that line. And then probably another alpha 1, 6 would uh, do the same. So in that case, the moment that I have an alpha 1, 6 here and another 1, 6 here, we are allowed to go away from that linear portion. In other words, the alpha 1, 6 glycosidic bond allows for branching of glucose molecules in glycogen. And truly enough, glycogen is really like just so many, many molecules of glucose. Some of them are in a linear fashion, but some branch out. Uh, from another branch, from another branch. So we could just say that glycogen is a highly branched polysaccharide of glucose. So with that said, it's very easy now to understand that all you need to do to make glycogen is to make alpha-1,4 and to make alpha-1,6 bonds. And conversely, in order to break down glycogen completely, all you have to do is to break down all those alpha-1,4 and those occasional alpha-1,6 glycosidic bonds. With that said, we will be discussing both glycogenesis, which is the synthesis of glycogen, and glycogenolysis, which is the breakdown of glycogen. First, maybe for the glycogenetic part, so the synthesis of glycogen, we assume that first we have a single molecule of glucose. Think of this green 
circle as that molecule of glucose. And then uh, we do know that we, if we want to convert it into G6P, this, this is actually a required step. We need the help of the enzyme hexokinase. So I'm going down. That kind of explains why you also have this arrow down in uh, glycogenesis. It's this part right here. So that we produce glucose 6-phosphate. Now, normally you would assume that we would go to glycolysis, but of course, if our body so requires uh, the synthesis of glycogen, it will not go here, but instead go to the right. Um, so before I proceed, you may ask, so what condition will allow us to say, uh, hey, G6P, you should become glycogen instead. And uh, usually that is triggered by the fed state. Because when we are in the fed state, our, remember, uh, our blood sugar rises. And you should know that glycogenesis is actually uh, a pathway wherein the effect is to reduce our blood sugar. Why is that? Remember this. Glycogen is a polysaccharide that is stored in our liver and muscle. So, for example... If you think of, let's say, uh, if you think that this is the liver and then we have the blood and then uh, when you eat, it is expected that your blood glucose rises. So there's a lot of glucose in your blood, right? Your body feels that and your body is like, again, going back to the principle of homeostasis, your body goes, oh, there's so much glucose. We need to reduce this. One of the ways our body would do that is to actually insert those glucose molecules into our liver and also, by the way, uh, our muscle. So that's liver and muscle. And then those glucose molecules are weaved together, attached together. And guess what? What's glucose when you attach them together? Oh, nothing more than just glycogen. So basically, by synthesizing glycogen, we are also eliminating a lot of glucose from the blood. So that's reduction of blood sugar, okay? And all I need to do later is to reverse that for glycogenolysis. Also, since uh, here we want to reduce blood sugar, this is uh, pretty much under the mercy of our insulin hormone. So it's stimulated by insulin. So yeah, so for example, let's say our insulin tells our body, hey, glucose, do not go here. Go here instead, become glycogen. So what happens after that? We have G6P first converted to G1P, so glucose 1-phosphate via phosphogluconeutase. Now, if you watched my glycolysis discussion, it would make sense to you that all, all of that's changed from G6P to G1P is the number because mutases only change the locant of the phosphate or whatever. So we now, at this point, have glucose 1-phosphate. What's next? If we want to make this green glucose part of glycogen, we need to first combine G1P with a molecule of uridine triphosphate or UTP. So this and this are combined. And then one of the three phosphates is released. So two remain. So from UTP, it will become UDP. And that diphosphate will be attached to that glucose, which remember is the green one we have originally. And uh, think of UDP glucose as the powered or the active form of glucose that Glucose alone will not be sufficient for synthesis of glycogen, but UDP glucose is. So now, once we have the active glucose here, which is UDP glucose, we could have it combined with this violet thing right here, which if you read it, look sub n, is actually my way of depicting, and I think other books also use this, this is their way of depicting glycogen. Why look sub n? That is because, remember, glycogen is nothing more than many, many molecules of glucose. So, of course, we should assume normally this accounts to several hundred or thousand molecules. But, of course, we have to start somewhere. And uh, that, uh, need, that, that makes me remind you or that uh, allows me to tell you that normally a human being does not make glycogen from scratch. There will always be a small chain of glucose molecules residing in our liver and muscles, which will be the initial glycogen molecule. Just to make things simpler, I'm drawing uh, my initial glycogen as the purple dots here, connected by the blue lines. And this initial glycogen molecule will combine with our single green glucose by the help of glycogen synthase. 
and do note that glycogen synthase is responsible for the synthesis of, so take note of the color blue, alpha-1,4 glycosidic bonds. Thus, notice what happens with the product. In my product, my product is gluc sub n plus 1. Of course, the gluc sub n is the original glycogen. The plus 1 comes from that one glucose that was color green. And basically, if I have a chain of glucose molecules, you could see that the blue lines here are actually the alpha-1 for glycosidic bonds I was drawing a while ago. And since glycogen synthase will add another alpha-1 for, notice that my green dot is connected by another blue line, which basically tells you that this one performs another alpha-1 for bond. However, you should know that glycogen is not just all 1-4, but it's also 1,6. So we should pay respect to the fact that there's another enzyme that adds the 1,6 glycosidic bond. And that one is called the branching enzyme, which is very fitting because alpha 1,6 is responsible for the branching. Uh, it's funny, but this is true. This is the real uh, commonly used name of the enzyme that adds the alpha 1,6 glycosidic bond. And again, as I mentioned, you would know it's an alpha-1,6 if you have a chain of glucose molecules going away from the straight line. So for example, my purple dots from the original glycogen and the green one form a straight chain because it's all alpha-1,4. But the moment I add the, these like orange glucose molecules by an alpha-1,6, you notice that these orange molecules are away from the original line because uh, if this is the linear portion, this one is like my depiction of a branch because of the branching enzyme, okay? And so glycogenesis is like that. All you need to do is to have your glycogen synthase constantly adding alpha-1 for bonds until this becomes longer and longer. And then every few residues or every few glucose molecules, you add uh, a short chain of, uh, of, of, of glucose molecules by branching enzyme to give you your branches. So it's just two enzymes, really, uh, of course, on top of the uh, enzymes we have at the start. That is glycogenesis for you. Now, how about the opposite case, glycogenolysis? Well, the good thing about glycogenolysis is like, you just have to do the opposite concept. So like, if we have your fed, then glycogenolysis is expected to happen during the fasted state. And then if its effect for glycogenesis is to reduce blood sugar, uh, glycogenolysis is to increase blood sugar. And that should make sense, right? Because now, if we go back to this depiction, like we go back to imagining this is the liver and this is the blood. Um, when you are, for example, fasted, and you are starving and your body is like, oh my God, I need glucose, please. Okay. And you are starving, right? Uh, that's why you have glycogen in the first place. You stored something because it is expected that in the future, you will need it, especially when you are very hungry. And of course, in that case, it means that your glycogen is supposed to be chopped into bits. And uh, when you chop it, you get many, many molecules of glucose, which ho hopefully you release from the liver and the muscle. Um, actually in the muscle, it will be used immediately, but from the liver, uh, those glucose molecules will be given back to the blood. And by giving it back to the blood, you are literally increasing blood sugar. Oh, of course, since uh, uh, this one is an increased blood sugar effect, this is instead stimulated by the enemy of insulin, which is glucagon. Yeah, so what are the things we need to know? We just need to counteract glycogen synthase and branching enzyme. That is to break this alpha-1,4 and break this alpha-1,6. First, for the alpha-1,6, if the name of the enzyme that adds the alpha-1,6 is a branching enzyme, then guess what? The name of the one which removes the alpha-1,6 is the debranching enzyme. So if I have this bond right here, uh, let me erase it a little bit. If I have this bond here, which is the alpha-1,6, the debranching enzyme will erase that such that this orange chain will be removed from my original purple chain. Of course, removing effectively this branch from the molecule. So I have now removed my alpha-1,6. We're now back to a linear chain. What's next? Of course, if I really want to break down this molecule further, I need to chop each alpha-1 for each blue line one by one, 
piece by piece. In order to do that, we need the enzyme glycogen phosphorylase, which will do two things. Number one, so let's imagine we have this violet times six plus one green. Glycogen phosphorylase will chop off that green, remove that alpha-1,4. So again, this one has the job of cutting off the alpha-1,4 glycosidic bond. So this green will be gone. So as you can see, it's now all violet again. But at the same time, you could uh, say, what happens to that green thing that you chop off from the word phosphorylase? We add phosphate. That's why when you remove this glucose from glycogen, it's not just glucose alone, but a glucose with a phosphate. No wonder if we go back and trace this, the phosphate, this, this is actually the phosphate I was talking about, will be added. And we are now back to glucose 1-phosphate. Now, this is easy from this point onward because uh, the phosphoglucomutase actually does the reversible step also, giving us back again our G6P. And if you really want to increase your blood sugar, you need to get rid of this phosphate. So uh, you may remember that the enzyme which will terminate that phosphate from the glucose is glucose 6-phosphatase, which actually is our visitor from gluconeogenesis, if you remember giving us glucose, which hopefully could now exit our liver and go to the blood. Now, of course, this arrow right here from glucose and then to the blood is applicable to our liver. But how about our muscles? Will our muscles do the same thing? And the answer is no, because remember, the muscles themselves need that sugar. So instead of like uh, converting G6P to glucose and then removing it from the muscle, the muscles just immediately use G6P for energy via glycolysis. So here, hopefully you're understanding why we need to be mindful of where the process is happening because even though the liver and the muscle may perform the same thing, which is glycogenolysis, the way that they utilize it may be different because the liver and the muscle are not the same organs. Uh, so by the way, that's why you see the arrows here for glycogenolysis. It's uh, going to the left because literally that's how we break down glycogen the way I ordered it in this drawing and then up because I'm referring to the liver's capability to convert G6P to glucose. Oh, by the way, that's because uh, if you remember, this enzyme is only present in the liver. That's why the liver could do this. Now, one last thing, but I will not be discussing it in this recording is that Occasionally, alongside the discussion of uh, glycogen metabolism, there's always the mention of glycogen storage diseases, which are basically conditions wherein there's a deficiency of some of the enzymes here, like glycogen synthase or phosphorylase, okay, or, 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 or the branching or debranching enzymes. And they have names. However, since it's relatively advanced, I would prefer not to discuss it here. Uh, the good thing about the glycogen storage diseases is that uh, they are usually tabulated and it's easy to search. So I may be attaching a link to this uh, in the caption, but uh, do know that such conditions exist. 